live from Boston, Massachusetts. It's The Q at the HP Vertica Big Data Conference 2014. Brought to you by HP. With your hosts, John Furrier and Dave Vellante. Okay, welcome back everyone. You are watching SiliconANGLE and Wikibon's The Cube. This is our flagship program where we go out to the events and extract the silly from the noise. I'm John Furrier with Dave Vellante, your host, and our next guest is Raj Yakali, Director of Data Infrastructure at Ed Marketplace uh, here at uh, live in Boston, Massachusetts for the HP Big Data Conference where all the experts are gathered uh, and talking about what's, what's going on in the industry from a technology standpoint, but also how it's, it's, it's changing the, the marketplace in terms of creating new products, new value. Raj, welcome to theCUBE. Thank you. So I got to ask you, what's the biggest thing that you're seeing in the marketplace right now from an from a, a infrastructure, software, cloud, mobile, social, big data certainly becoming a big conversation. Uh, anyone who uses Facebook or any social network or mobile knows that their data is being used in some capacity to create a better product experience, in some cases get a good discount on, on, on stuff. <laughs> what is driving all this? Is it really big data? What, what's the big technology? Uh, I think uh, the two things are coming together. One, the technology space is converging in itself where the, the constraints that we used to have in the past, they're not there anymore, uh, or the new constraints are coming up which is like the storage and the memory area sectors with, with respect to the technology, uh, they are converging together and that is making us to do more than what we used to do with less. And at the same time, the user requirements, uh, we're able to go beyond the past user requirements, the new user requirements are coming in, which are uh, like, for example, we were doing the analytics for a while and then now we are doing the predictive analytics and very soon we are thinking about the prescriptive analytics which is beyond the user is asking for. So, prescriptive or predictive? Uh, prescriptive. prescriptive. Uh, next level of the predictive. <laughs> that's what. Yeah, break the difference down, that's really good. This is, this is a nuance, but for the data geeks, it's kind of like just, they just roll off their tongue, prescriptive. P describe the difference between predictive analytics and prescriptive analytics, because these are two hot areas right now where everyone's looking at it from across the board. Customer service, manufacturing, sales, both are relevant. Talk about the difference between the two. So when you talk about the predictive analytics, uh, you are actually predicting something based upon what you have currently based upon previous patterns and whatnot. Uh, and when it comes to the prescriptive analytics, you're actually following the all, you're utilizing all the current content that you have on the user base or the requirements, but at the same time, you're actually anticipating what is that the, the user might need at a later stage, even before they ask or even before they even come to you. So you know does one it. use more collective intelligence than the other? It's a... Or is it more of a data set discussion? It's, a, it's a, a layer above the current level of intelligence. I was talking to a data scientist, we were talking about Costco, and you walk in the front door of Costco, and you know, I'm in their demographic, so when I go in, all I see is big screen TVs, and I say to myself, I want one, because when I walk in, all I see is really low priced big screen TVs, and I say, I want one. So there, is that prescriptive or predictive analysts, where they kind of know my, they create product placement for me without even knowing what I might want? So, uh if you go uh, for a fine grain of what, a fine grain line between the, uh, fine, the thin line between the predictive and prescriptive is like the factors that you know currently about the user, the factors that you do not know currently about that user, but you can actually anticipate all those new factors that might be created. Um, can you give an example? Uh, like for example, on the predictive analytics uh, today, uh, for example, if you take the ad marketplace as a uh, place uh, where I actually work for. Uh, in the ad marketplace, user is searching for a certain keyword or saying, okay, I want to do this. I want to buy uh, like a cheap wine in New York. He's telling us very clearly that this is what I want. Now I'm predicting, okay, he wants to buy a red wine. What kind of the red wine is he trying to buy? So I have certain factors already in, with me and using that I'm actually trying to think about what is he, what is he asking for and I'm predicting his user intent, the user intent I'm predicting on, the, based so on what he's told. screw opener or some other accessory kind of thing? Yeah. Yeah. Do I need to get him the wine from Napa Valley? The red wine, which kind of red wine? Is it Napa Valley red wine or is it like Chile, Chile Cabrio Sauvignon or something like that? That's where I'm actually predicting, but which is very closely related. 
now again based upon the wine uh, consumption that he is having and uh, depending on the kinds of searches that he is doing, I am thinking about totally unrelated like okay is he trying to uh, is it the time for him to buy an insurance or is it the time for him to actually uh, check out uh, his wine consumption might be going up or down is it time to go for a doctor checkup or or is it like oh is going to uh, is his health is going to be much better than it used to be because he is consuming the red wine so do i have to buy, um, do, does it is it the time that he needs to buy a new pair of sneakers so that he can actually go jog around that's prescriptive that's so, prescriptive so just example. so are they both prescriptive so being able to to prescribe the type of wine okay is part of it and then there there are ancillary outcomes so i'm, I'm interested in the technology behind that because John, my wife will go out and she'll always say, I want this red wine and I want a peanut and wine, I want it to be berry and you know, she'll describe it and some bartenders can't do it or waiters and other ones, this is one waiter gets it every time. Oh, I got the wine for you. So how are you able to replicate that in technology? Um, one, uh, we actually capture a lot of information with respect to the keywords or the user content and we create the dictionaries out of all this. Uh, when it comes to the user searches uh, in our marketplace. Uh, we have this keyword-based uh, searches, keyword-based ad serving, and at the same time we have this category-based ad serving. And uh, we also um, try to figure it out based upon the geospatial analysis and also the kind of traffic source that they're coming from to when they ask us about, okay, provide me this kind of service. So we're actually uh, analyzing all these factors that come together. And that's what we combine all these factors together and try to provide them the best thing that would cater to their needs. So, so okay, so I, I, so I understand and that. And the technology, how it comes together is that the big data. Uh, we actually uh, get almost half a billion requests per day. And uh, along with that, there's like two terabytes of data per hour that, we are, that is being generated as a result of these requests. And with all this data coming together, now we have to perform the analytics on top of this. So Vertica is one of the, uh, uh, one of the technologies that provides us the analytical capabilities to mine these data sets. And along with that, the new HDFS, Hadoop, and all these ecosystems put together, and the AWS for the processing computing powers, everything comes together. And this technology plays a big role in analyzing all these data sets and providing the customer with uh, right set of user intent uh, and, and aligned ads. And you've got to do that, I'll, I'll, I'll invoke the real time phrase, but yes. you've got to do it in real time before the customer goes away. That's yes. what I would consider real time. Yes. Fair enough? Yes. So are you bringing in analytical and transaction systems to be able to do that and al allow machines to make decisions before humans can, because you can't do it in human time, right? it's too, too slow. That's right. Um, so. We have two products that we have recently uh, innovated and created in our uh, system, which is the BidSmart. What it does is like it performs the price matching, and at the same time, it performs. Uh, it it has, it's a predictive algorithm system uh, that actually crunches through all these data sets and actually takes into the factor all the variables that are in place to make the decision quickly, and suited and suitable to the user intent at the speed of light as, so, that we, uh, so that we can cater to the needs of the customer in the real time. And uh, on top of that, there is an analytic piece of it that actually supports uh, marketers. We have this uh, heavy data savvy marketers, uh, largest data savvy marketers on our user base. And they want to have the fine grain visibility into how they are spending their ad money and uh, the ROI towards the ad spends so we provide all that through with uh, Advertiser 3D and the BidSmart, and uh, it utilizes the real time by, whenever the click data comes into uh, our system, our network, that click data is being directly streamed into a Vertica. And that provides us the real time capabilities of analyzing all the data through, so that our the marketers are able to see that in the real time as to what is happening with the clicks and the, uh, and the required requests that are coming in from the user base. So the database is Vertica. It's database. not an in-memory database. 
We, uh, the or pricing and matching is supported by our in-memory database. Uh, we have an in-memory database as well that supports the pricing and matching. And then the analytics is being supported by our analytical database, which is Vertiga. I see. Okay, and, and, and the storage is not spinning, or is it, right? Or is it flash, is it, um, so it's in memory, you got? It's a flash and SSD combinations, yeah, okay. and uh, to certain data sets, we also have the uh, storage as a The cold drive, storage. Cold storage that we don't need the real-time insights from. Right. So we have this layered uh, data sets. Uh, there are certain data sets that you want the real-time insights. And so you're, you you're essentially competing with, with Google in a way, right? Um, when, uh, are they we, part of your ecosystem, or are you part of their ecosystem? We complement Google's ecosystem. Uh, the Google actually has a search engine on their back, so it actually, uh, they take up all that part. And beyond Google and Yahoo Bing, we are the largest uh, search, in, uh, search, uh, search content marketplace. So what we do is we complement their offers. When the ad marketers go on to the Google and so, and they, they are not able to meet their uh, requirements just by the Google, they actually reach out to the ad marketplace and uh, they actually extend their uh, uh, user base and they get new user base that is not available at uh, or, su or, su or supported by Google's platform or the Yahoo Bing platforms. Um, and that make, that gets realized because of the search uh, market that is fractured between all these technologies and the tool sets and everything. And now with the mobile space coming into play, the search is everywhere, even inside the apps. There are like 100 apps in our uh, mobile phone or so, and each app provides a search mechanism. So all that fragmented search is, uh, is not on the Google now. It's not yeah. on Apple or it's not on the Yahoo Bing or anything. So this is the place we actually come into play where we connect all this, this is fragmented user, this board. Is the, this is the new user experience. Yes. I've been talking to Dave, you know I've been blogging about this for a decade. Google's great for web 1.0, maybe 2.0, but now the new user experience is mobile in these new environments. So the queries, what they're searching for is much more, less about static content, but very contextual based, yes. app based. Um, so I got to ask you the next question, which is um, the holy grail right now is um, along the lines of this predictive, prescriptive algorithms, and everyone's talking social sales. Oh, funnel the data in, and we'll trap them into a funnel, we'll identify who the right person is at the right time to sell them a product to give them some value. Yes. Very hard technical problem. Share your insights uh, on, on that whole paradigm. Um, looking at all this data from either Twitter, social data, LinkedIn, Facebook. Obviously Facebook's doing very well with their business based on social data. Um, but ultimately it's about matching the exact context. Certainly we were talking about how bad Facebook's retargeting is um, in an earlier segment and how it's just, I go to one website just to look at something, now I'm seeing that ad in Facebook all day long and they say, like, I can't get rid of it. That's uh, one thing that actually differentiates us from any of the other players on the market is uh, we have the user search intent. User is asking us to provide them with certain uh, service. They are telling us what to give them. Only thing is uh, the, we make it much more simpler by actually doing much more analysis on top of that and provide them with the app. So we have, they have, they know what they want but they don't know all the details uh, that go into what it means like, because they have to take into consideration of the geo, they have to take into consideration of the market space and the industry, that, uh, the products that are available. So all that analysis and all, that, uh, uh, all those dimensions, we actually crunch it through and provide it to the user space. And when, it, when we talk about the social space and all those things, over there, you're, you have no uh, connection point as to what the user is asking. There is, user is not asking any, for anything. You're actually assuming on top of uh, what the user activity is. Based upon the user activity, you are, we are assuming that, oh, they might want this, they might want this. So that is a tough problem to There's make. There's a startup out there that's funded by Sequoia C uh, Capital called Mintigo, which is doing some really interesting um, social sales. They use a lot of big data techniques to give customers who got, use like the sales force of the world just a better understanding of like their prospects. And it seems like a very hard problem. What's your take on that whole big data application? Because it's very similar to what you're talking about. It's ads in a way, but it's more native to the user. So, uh, does that system have the user, um, do they track and record user activity? And no, it's what all models? user target name, and then they aggregate other date source data and try to match the two. 
So they have maybe your name or Twitter handle or maybe not, just your name and email address. Then they look at the web and all the social signals and then identify whether you're ready to buy that product. Yes. So very interesting paradigm because there's no touch points other than data. So because there are no touch points, it becomes much harder problem. Then now they have to create some touch point right there. That creating the touch point is where the big data and the, all these appliances and everything comes together because it requires a lot of processing power, it requires a lot of time and But with energy cloud, you can it. spin up some, basically a mini supercomputer. Yes, but there is, that's the complexity that comes with it. Uh, it's, cloud provides the uh, processing power and then the, there is a storage and also your ingrown, in homegrown <laughs> mechanics that have to come together along with it. It's going to come right back down to the database problem, so I'm going to go right there. So let's go back to the database. So we were just talking earlier with the VP of engineering here at Vertica. You know, does the database actually go away? Does it get abstracted away at some point in the future where the decision from the application and or the data, because if the thesis is put smarts in the data, then you should essentially not have to worry about where to store it technically. Where in the past it's been, what's my data schema look like, database, that will pro project the syntax into what I can do. So the question is, I want to get your take on this, kind of a kind of interesting time to have this conversation in, in, in our industry because you can actually abstract away the database. It shouldn't have to be your only limitation is based on the database. What's your take on that conversation? Is it, is it a good time to have that? Are people actually doing that? Yeah, people are already doing it. Almost all the social space is about uh, no schema, schema-less and all that, uh, which means that if you are trying to conform that into the database uh, schema and schemas and all that, uh, which it becomes harder to uh, conform, uh, conform all the data sets into the database, and so they were trying to actually get the extract the value out of that system, uh, out of the data set, even before you insert it into the data set. That's where the whole HP flex zone and everything comes together. You know, the interesting uh, thing about things like Spark, for instance, Dave and I were just talking about Spark, which came out of Berkeley. I think Databricks is one of those companies up there. Um, is that in memory has become a huge deal. Open source obviously is driving it. But the notion of real time has changed the game, right? Yes. So we talk about retargeting. How much does real time make it diffi more difficult and complicated for these kinds of channels to provide real time contextual information to the user at any given time uh, that would match them for, for uh, it's the business context. Uh, now, if the, if the business has to survive the competition, or so uh, the real time really makes the impact. And uh, being able to serve the needs of the customer in the real time, and if you are to be in the competition, you have to be aggressive and uh, forefront. And the technology really plays a role at that point. And the spark in memory, and even the SSDs, and the convergence of the storage and the memory, it's all coming together towards providing that real-time insights into this piece. Um, it's all about the feedback loop. So you have this feedback loop now, you have to tighten it and closer that loop as well because your insights have to be much faster as well because it spurs the innovation later on. If you want, if the innovation, if the feedback loop is longer, then the innovation takes much longer. Mm -hmm. If the feedback loop is shorter and tightened out, your innovation is right on, spot on, and much faster. So, so you're talking about timetable now, on, it's a syncing up timetable to actual data acquisition and analysis, right? Yes. So if you, have, you don't want to mismatch the cycles. No, you don't. You want to really try to be able to match it up together. Can you give an example of how you've then done that one time, like can, and, and what that what that means in context to if you didn't do it. Give an example of of the benefits of matching up these cycles. Uh, would you would you mind refreshing that cycles? So you mentioned that okay, time to get the data. Yes. And then time to analyze it and turn that around. If it's longer versus that, what's the, give an example? A concrete. Can you give a concrete example of, of uh, how that would play out? Uh, for example, at the ad marketplace, when you when the user searches for the data set and uh, when the user searches for a certain phrase, saying I, uh, "flowers in Chelsea," now I have to provide him the ad within like sub milliseconds. If I, if there is, if the if we don't provide that uh, service with an ad to the user within sub milliseconds, he's actually getting away from our site right mm -hmm. there. He won't be staying there much longer. So in the, now the time <coughs> cycles that are required for the data that is coming in and you are crunching with the, your data dictionaries that you are captured and you are going around for the, all the feeds and everything together. 
that has to be much faster and in order to provide it in the sub milliseconds, the rest of the pieces in the chain have to be much faster as well. And now the, that's where the whole in-memory and the storage comes into play, which helps us to churn these data sets and give that, get that inside. I want you to share with the folks out there the difference between born in the cloud DevOps versus not born in the cloud legacy technology. And this is more of a broader question. <coughs> you were seeing successes out there like Snapchat, Uber, you some great examples of companies that have come out of nowhere and just created billions of dollars of wealth because of doing things differently. Yes. Fast, agile, I mean, Dropcam was an example. We interviewed the founder at AWS Summit, sold for half a billion dollars to Google with the Nest team. It was, a, it was a webcam connected to the cloud. I mean, big deal, half a billion. But what he did was he used the cloud to innovate on the storage piece of the value chain, which creates significant value for him. This is a whole nother mindset. I call that born in the cloud. So explain to the folks out there who are watching, there's between born in the cloud mentality and non-born in the cloud mentality. Born in the cloud mentality is uh, be ready for the failure from the system point of view, but at the same time now they are trying to utilize these um, resources. Uh, even though it seems like there are resources, a uh, vast amount of resources, there is a cost uh, consideration that comes along with uh, all these resources that are available. So they have to really think about how to um, do more with less, even though they are born in the cloud. So. That is one mentality when, with the, when it comes to the legacy environment or so, um, yeah, you have those resources for granted. But at the same time, while this agile mentality is coming in, it's changing both sides of the world. Uh, the born in the cloud, they already come with that agile mentality and the DevOps, men, DevOps mode and the same thing. And the legacy pieces are actually um, very quickly catching up with the same methodologies. So even now, even with the even if they have the hardware and the infrastructure yeah. in the You mentioned the converged infrastructure. You know, the other thing that um, was talked about this week was BuzzFeed's $50 million financing uh, on, at $850 million valuation. And what that really means is that's basically a, you know, social media list post company, top 10 reasons to do something, has, so, has generated so much traffic from, because of the channels that they distribute the content in. Now making a serious run at the New York Times, these big publications, that's an example of this new model of full stack kind of company. So this notion of integrating silos together yes. is an interesting DevOps problem. Dave, we were talking about this earlier. It's like the way people rethink <coughs> these new business models is they say, hey, you know what? I'm just going to do it differently. I can optimize in a vertical or full stack basis and create value. Well, that a lot of people to are trying to a lot of people are trying to figure out. Okay, you know, there's a share shift going on. Right? Amazon's growing at 60, 70 percent a year. It's going to be do five billion in revenue this year. You know, there aren't a lot of enterprise IT companies you know doing that. Um, so people are saying, okay, is that the new model? Many people believe yes, it is. But at the same time, you got. HP, IBM, EMC, VMware, Cisco saying, well, we can replicate born in the cloud on premise. And we have a more complex problem because we have application portfolios that are very diverse. Our average, the average age of an enterprise application is 19 years, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So people are trying to figure out, us included, how that's going to shake out. What's, what's your opinion you know, as a practitioner in that world? It's a cycle of innovation. There are two factors that are coming together. The one is uh, user uh, requirements uh, and the user base that you have with your product. And the other side of the piece is, there is that fragmentation that is happening as the new companies are born and the new methodologies. There is also the repetition of that same work happening at all these companies that are out there. So what AWS is doing is, uh, AWS and the whole Amazon and the whole thing is, they're capitalizing on that repetition of the process that is occurring in, across all the ecosystem. What they're saying is, come to me, you will be able, we will provide you with all the API and you will be able to use it exactly alike and we can provide you the platform. So that is one side of the picture where the convergence is coming together on all these best practices and the different companies are coming together. And the other side of the picture is, you have a customer base and you have a user base. By going to the AWS, you either have to uh, go with a specific uh, specific infrastructure, specific uh, instances and specific memory also, which is almost equivalent to your hardware internally because it's a reserved instances versus not. So you have to cater to your user-based requirements. Uh, there are certain user-based requirements that within your use cases that may not be able to uh, cater when you are in the public space. Uh, so you are going for average performance. Yeah. There is a possibility of that. Uh, so that 
in which and what cycle of the growth phase you are in that may dictate or that may uh, guide towards whether you want to be in the public space or even in your own space or not and uh, what is that you want to get out of that. Whole. But now, you, 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 I think you hit on it, repetition of the process. Amazon essentially is able to package that exactly. pro process and the, their, their marginal economics of deploying infrastructure you know, incrementally goes to zero compared to you know, doing it every time, you know, right if, whether you call out you know, a third party or whomever. You would think, conceptually, that over the next 10 years, the Amazon way overwhelms the traditional way. Why would it not? If we want, uh, that is a very good question, but uh, and uh, if we want to, uh, if we take a step back and try to analyze that same um, aspect, uh, the user search as it was before. So you have this created content on your publisher <laughs> space, and now it is fragmented out into the web space again. Um, but now it is, usually before it was fragmented in this created content, now it is fragmented within the mobile space. Yeah. So you have a totally different uh, ecosystem created mm -hmm. with it but it, is, it has followed the same cycle. Now when it comes to this technology and the proliferation, proliferation and as well as the consolidation, yes, it is evolving. Now there are new set of challenges that are going to come in together, which is, yeah, now that AWS is a solution for the repetition that is occurring in the system, then now we are getting in there. Now there is a new level of user requirements that are coming to come, uh, come into, uh, they are going to come into picture where there is again that fragmentation. You, pro you provide the average kind of service when you are in the public space because you, have to, you, you may get similar service as your neighbor is getting. Now that may be okay, but that may not be okay. When it is not okay, now you are again coming back. It goes to a certain extent, and then beyond that certain extent, if you are growing and growing and growing and beyond, there are internal inherent challenges that needs to be taken care of, either by Amazon or by even by the customer who is on Amazon. Yeah. So the incremental challenges, are they able to align those incremental challenges with the solutions that are provided by the provider? If they can provide it, yes, but then again, as the scale of that system goes and larger and larger, and larger they won't be able to cater to each and every personal need or each and every organizational need on this big ecosystem. Mm -hmm. So that's where it again comes back. And right. But it just, uh, but there is an innovation space that gets created at that point, where you are not really tackling the similar problem, but you are tackling a different set of problems. Right, right, and you've got the scale to do it. Yes. Yeah. Raj, thanks so much for coming on theCUBE. Raj Yakali, uh, data architect. Um, I think I just followed you on Twitter. You Raj uh, underscore architect yes. on Twitter. Okay, I just followed you. Love to get you involved more in the conversation. This is really something that we're passionate about. If you're available, uh, we'll ping you on Twitter. We'll do some crowd chats if you're cool. We're going to do sure. a predictive analytics chat this Friday. Uh, this is an area where all the innovation is happening. Certainly data science is well documented. Wall Street Journal had a great article uh, this past week on data science, but where the action is really going is really more programming, computer science, some really good stuff happening around data. I think what you're doing is really the center of it. Congratulations, great to have you here on theCUBE. To hear from the experts, the tech athletes, this is theCUBE. I'm John Furrier, Dave Vellante. Go to crowdchat.net slash hpbigdata2014 and join the conversation. We're having a crowd chat right now. That's our new engagement container. Watch that, we'll be right back after the short break and we'll take questions from Twitter on our next guest. Take care.